All right, this is a little Volkswagen video. I've gotten several questions here in the last uh, couple of weeks, emails and such. People wanting to know different things about different stuff. So we'll try to cover some of that in this video. And uh, this is basically going to be a Volkswagen video. So if you don't like that kind, just uh, now would be a good time to move on to the next video. But anyway, we'll go over a few things here. Uh, the first question was, how do you tell a forged piston from a cast piston? And uh, I have a forged 1600 piston here. And you can see the uh, inside of the piston is uh, one construction. There's no uh, foreign material in the piston. It's all cast as one piece. And uh, it's got those beefy ribs in the skirt there. And here, I'll show you... Uh, cast piston. It's a cast piston it usually has those lugs in it. Uh, you can get a hyper eutectic piston. They make a lot of those now and they don't have the uh, metal slug in them and uh, it's a pretty good choice if you're going to build a street motor and not get to detonate it. The hyper eutectic stuff is fine and it is a step up from the uh, stock piston for sure. Uh, the other question was how can you tell if you have a B piston or an A? And what a B and A stands for is an A is a uh, standard stroke, and a B would be a uh, stroker piston. And what that means is they move this pin up on the piston for the longer stroke, so it doesn't come out of the top of the cylinder. And you can usually tell because the pin location is right under the oil ring. Uh, some of the J and E pistons that we get special ordered, the uh, oil ring is actually in the pin. You actually have to, you know, it's part of the oil ring. Uh, here's the standard stroke. You can see there's a little distance between the ring right here and the wrist pin. And this is 69 stroke and this is 82 stroke. So that's how you can tell the difference between a A and a B. A B will be a stroker piston. The pin will be close to the oil ring and then A We'll have the standard pen location. Okay, so we covered forged pistons, not forged pistons, stroker piston, and a non-stroker piston. The uh, next question was rocker arms and uh, camshaft selection. Uh, there's a couple different options. You can get SCAT rockers, uh, CB Performance makes rockers, Potter makes them. Uh, Berg is making them again, I do believe. Uh, it's not the, like the old style Berg rocker, but I hear they're pretty good. Uh, most of the entry level uh, camshafts, uh, you'll hear of uh, solid rocker shaft kits. And that's basically what we have here in my hand. Uh, it consists of a shaft that has uh, threaded ends on it and it eliminates all the uh, clips. the wavy washers. These are what people talk about breaking a lot. I will tell you that uh, I've been running stock rockers on my uh, 1600. It has a heavy valve spring on it and I'm running the uh, C35 cam and I have uh, had no issues. I've never broke a uh, wavy washer and uh, I've had pretty good luck not having the solid shafts. Uh, the reason that I choose not to run the uh, solid shafts is they're a little noisier and for 1600 if you can make the valve train quiet and it'll hold up then you know that's probably the way to go. I, uh, if I'm building a motor for somebody I traditionally use the solid shaft kit just because it eliminates you having any problem with getting these uh, wafy washers stuck in your oil pump and that seems to be where these things like to end up. I don't know how they get in there because uh, that's way bigger than the oil pump hole, but that's usually where you find it or in the distributor drive gear. And it's this one, not the uh, big one I had in my hand. And that's called the wavy washer. And that's what preloads the rocker arm. So we have a solid shaft rocker that utilizes a stock uh, Volkswagen rocker. And there's a couple different uh, options when it comes to the adjuster. You can use the stock adjuster or you can use these uh, this is a 911 adjuster here. They have the Ford Cortina adjuster. And this is the uh, bug pack adjuster. Now I uh, 
don't like to say bad things about stuff, but I did buy a set of these. You can tell these are pretty new. I put these on a motor for a YouTuber and had them fail here. So I uh, put my rockers on, sent the motor out with the uh, 911 adjusters. These hardly ever fail on you, but they are uh, expensive. I think they're 20 bucks a piece or $10. I don't remember which. I think they used to be 20 and now they're, or they used to be 10 and now they're 20. So times eight. Uh, these are pretty reasonable. And uh, like I said, I might have just got a bad batch, but this doesn't feel, you know, like it's very quality. And this is uh, much longer than this one here that mimics the uh, stock length here much closer. So a lot of times when you run this uh, super long when you have to end up putting a shim under the rocker and moving it up to get the proper adjustment in geometry. Uh, 15 millimeter nuts on rocker arms uh, on, a, on a stock rocker. I don't like to do it. You can do it on a, a aftermarket rocker. They have a much uh, beefier block and the material they use is much stronger. So you can go ahead and use the uh, head stud bolt or nut. Uh, it's 15 millimeter outside circumference and it's uh, 8 millimeter 125 on the inside. And a lot of guys like to use those on the rockers and they feel like it holds the rocker a little better. I personally use them on mine and uh, I have seen this happen. Uh, you can over tighten the stock one and break it. So be careful with that. That's just uh, one tip, you know, don't over tighten it if you're going to use the bigger nuts. It's just uh, 18 foot pounds and just be happy with the extra surface area that nut gives you and uh, it makes it a little nicer. I guess the next question was uh, valve size and uh, what do you reface and what do you replace. And traditionally I don't like to reuse uh, exhaust valves. Exhaust valves aren't that expensive. This is uh, traditionally what I like to use in a stock head. When I do a valve job, I replace them with the uh, TRW piece. It's pretty uh, reasonably priced and it's good insurance. Uh, you can reface the uh, intake valve. Here's an intake valve that's been serviced and replaced. You want to make sure that you have a good margin here before you reface the valve. That's going to determine whether you can uh, reface the valve or not, the amount of margin you have. And this margin goes away each time you reface the valve. It gets thinner and thinner. Uh, once it gets too thin, it'll glow, stay hot, and it'll cause detonation. Uh, so that's another reason I don't like to reface exhaust valves. You have a lot more temperature on that side. And uh, if they're thin on the margin, they will definitely uh, start to glow. And we never know how much temperature has been on this stem. So here's a... a I thought I had a broken one up here just to show you that they do break occasionally. I don't know what happened to the... There it is. So here's the... Uh, this is actually a stainless steel valve. And uh, it's broken. So they do break. Uh, you know, it's not a... It's not a... Uh, great quality piece. The uh, factory valve is actually a two-piece valve. And uh, the stainless steel valve is a one piece so a lot of times I'll upgrade to the stainless steel depending on what kind of spring I put on the uh, head and that really determines on the budget and what kind of cam you're going to run uh, we looked at the reface this is a Volkswagen valve that's been refaced and it'll be uh, back in service you want to expect the stem and make sure that it doesn't have excessive wear and uh, take it somewhere that can do the tips for you and reface them and uh, you should be able to use your intake valve over. Uh, as you increase the size of the uh, valve, traditionally they go to a double spring or a heavier single. Uh, I use these quite a bit. They're a pretty good single. They work really good on the C35. Uh, I think you could probably use these on a K7 if you didn't use the high list and you used a uh, stock rocker. They would work okay. And you'd have to keep in mind that you have a single spring on the car, so you can't abuse it too much. Uh, this isn't a good example of a double. These are some uh, eliminator heads that I have on the bench here that I'm assembling. But this is a K-motion double spring. And, uh, of course, as the valve gets bigger, it gets heavier. And we have to increase the uh, spring pressure to control the valve on the seat. 
So uh, you can probably, I would recommend, you know, maybe a 40 millimeter valve with a, a stock spring. And depending on the engine speed that you're going to run it at would determine whether you could get away with a uh, double spring or not. One thing for sure that you should be warned about if traditionally, you know, if you run a single spring, you can have really good luck with uh, cam life and lifter life uh, when you start out in valve spring pressure. Of course, it uh, wears the cam and lifters quite a bit faster. Uh, you have to have enough spring to control the uh, lifter over this nose here. And uh, you just want just enough. You don't want to overspring the car. I don't like these K-Motion springs. I think they're about 240 on the seat, maybe 800 over the nose. They're ridiculous. And I can almost guarantee you the cam's going to wipe out with these. But for all out racing, that's pretty much what we use to uh, get the 9,000 RPM out of the motor and control the valve at that speed. But for a street motor, you'd be uh, suited with a, you know, a, a standard double or a standard double spring or a uh, heavy single would be sufficient depending on the RPM range of the motor. Now as far as camshafts, I uh, I don't really like the uh, W grinds anymore. Uh, this is a 120 back from the old day. I was in a motor and uh, they have a pretty nice lobe design on them. It's not really radical. It's not really peaky. The 110 and the 100, if you look at the way the lobe is ground, it's sort of very angled and it causes the lifter to bounce over the top of it and it makes it hard for the spring to be able to control the uh, lifter. So I like to buy the cams that are sort of rounded and what I did was I sort of experimented with uh, high lift cams uh, running a stock rocker. So there we have the W series which is designed for a stock rocker or maybe a one you know a, a small upgrade on the rockers and then you have the FK series which is designed for a, a high lift rocker and different cam companies have different part numbers but they'll specify whether it's for a high lift rocker or a solid rocker just a, a standard what is it a 1.1 to 1 or 1 1.2 I'm not exactly sure of the factory ratio there but uh, looking at this cam chart, we were talking about building a uh, 74 by 94 with a C35, and I don't think that's going to be enough cam for uh, your motor. Uh, and the C35, one thing you got to remember about the C35 and the C45 both have a very choppy idle, and it's uh, designed to do that. It's like what I call it the steak and shake idle. They do make decent power. But if you're looking for all-out performance, uh, you know, there's better cams out there, I think. I, I do use the C35 quite a bit in the Super 1600. It seems to work really good with a stock rocker arm and a little bit of uh, port work on the cylinder head and the single spring. If you use a stock valve, this is a very good cam. But if you're going to increase the valve size, you're going to need a little more airflow. You would have to at least go to the C45. And the C45, I have one here, they're pretty nice. Uh, they do have that choppy idle, but the scat cams do come on a chilled billet and they are clearance for a stroker. So you don't have to do as much work to these. You can order an angle for a stroker. You just have to specify when you uh, order the cam. And there's several different cam companies. Cams are sort of a personal preference, you know. Uh, I like what, what doesn't wipe out. I do like the K7 is a really good cam. I do not like the K8. I think if you're going to run a K8, you might as well get the C45. They're real close in the C45. You can run a, a, a ratio rocker on it if you want. Uh, so uh, the K7 is probably a cam that I would recommend to look at. You could run it with a uh, stock rocker and when you go to a 1.4 or 1.5 it's almost 500 lift. So you can actually move up and gain some power down the road and uh, just do a rocker change and break the motor in with the one-to-one -one rockers. Uh, a lot of times people don't like to do that because you have to uh, make two sets of push rods. A lot of times when you put a high lift rocker on you'll have to change the push rod length. So that's something that you'll have to decide in the beginning whether you want to go through that. And uh, you can set it up both ways but a lot of people don't have the money for the uh, high lifts. 
and uh, a lot of people don't need 500 lift but what what happens is with these uh, bigger cams you can see how round the lobe design is and it's very mellow for the lifter to go over and it's uh, it's almost roller like it follows that lobe a lot easier and a lot of these uh, high lift cams have you know 400 at the cam anyway with a one-to-one -one rocker that's more than enough for a 1600 so uh, I've experimented with the K8 with one one rockers and a 1600 and I've uh, gone back to the C45 if you want it to be really peppy I like that especially if you're going to add a 78 crank you know you're probably going to want to add a little bit of camshaft uh, the other thing to consider is the uh, weight of the valve train the bigger the valve gets the heavier it gets uh, 77 grams 88 grams and I think this one's 112 so the bigger the valve gets the bigger the spring the more pressure we have to have on the seat to control that valve so that's something to consider when you buy your cylinder heads you know you don't want to get gigantic on the uh, the valves especially for a 1600 you'll have issues with the uh, valves clearing the cylinder so uh, 40 millimeter valves probably really sufficient for a 1600 you know it'd be more than enough a stock valve head will make great power on a 1600 that's what I would recommend just uh, stock valves a little bit of port work and then spend your money on some springs and you know a nicer cam so uh, those were those questions about camshafts and the cams that I like uh, the K7 is a really good choice if you're going to run a stock rocker and then if you're going to eventually add more carburetor and want more performance you can add to ratio rocker uh, they have two different types of retainers we have the uh, titanium which are uh, super flyweight and then you can get the chrome molly which are on the heavier side so you know if you go to a bigger valve I always recommend the titanium retainer it's a cheap upgrade <coughs> and it uh, it lightens up the valve train quite a bit so uh, distributors, that's preference, uh, total preference there. Every distributor will run fine in a motor, uh, different curves for different setups. So you have to determine the uh, RPM that you're going to run your cam in. You can tailor your, tailor your advanced curve. Some of the people have uh, Megaspark, CB Performance. They have some uh, aftermarket vacuum advanced distributors that have adjustable curves and uh, you can tailor a really nice street curve. I always like to use the 09, I'm sort of simpleton. It works well. And uh, with an MSD, it's, uh, it's hard to beat. I mean, I use it on my race car, and I've never had it miss a beat. So uh, they make better distributors, though. That's not the uh, best distributor in the world by any means. It's just uh, good for a lot of people's budget. And I think that's why there's so many of them sold. And now that they've uh, repopped them, I think you can pick one of these up for about 35 40 bucks you know uh, I personally don't like to use the components that come with the distributor I always buy a set of points and a condenser and if I'm too lazy to put them in I just throw them in the glove box just in case but uh, yeah an 09 is fine Petronics I mean there's a lot of good distributors on the market and you sort of have to decide what you're sort of looking for you know whether you want all-out performance or if you're just gonna you know drive around town uh, on my race car I don't have any advanced curve it's just locked in at 24 degrees we weld the uh, plate and there's no advance at all so you know it's hard to start like that you have to be able to roll the motor over and then hit the ignition but uh, on a turbo car you don't need an advanced curve uh, we always pretty much just lock it in uh, we do have a computer on Noel's car and we can actually pull timing at it whatever we want to do as we get on the track but uh, my car sort of manual so uh, lifters uh, you asked about lifters I like the scat lifters uh, if you're gonna buy an Ingle cam they make really nice lifters you can get a match set get the uh, K7 cam with their uh, angle lifters and you'll be really uh, grooving uh, I think a lot of the uh, cam issues that were out there were the oil. Uh, I don't think it was so much the cam manufacturers. I don't think a manufacturer would uh, cheapen the process and have that kind of an issue. You know, I think it's uh, 
I want to make sure you put some zinc in the oil or it's something that's made for a flat tappet camshaft. Uh, the newer cars have rollers in them and they're hardened steel so they they don't need a friction modifier and the uh, zinc ZDP is what they took out of the oil and uh, it's a way to wipe out your uh, flat tappet cam motor and shorten the life of your old car and uh, I'm not tell anybody but apparently the ZDP or the zinc uh, messes with the catalytic converters was their uh, reasoning behind taking that out so I always tell people to be uh, conscious of the oil they put in the car and use the break-in oil and uh, use as many precautions as you can when you put a new camshaft in. The other question I had was would I build a motor for somebody they were in uh, Canada and it's a father and son deal and I'll be glad to work with you you know if you want me to build a motor I'll build it for you or you just email Andrea and uh, you can throw me a little bone at the end there or you know we can do it together over the line and uh, I can make videos for you and you can do it yourself uh, there's plenty of videos on YouTube where you can build a 1600 uh, no problem uh, three or four or five six guys out there that have how to assemble engines in between all those videos you can get a wealth of knowledge and uh, assemble your motor and be pretty damn confident that it's going to run really well there's several different guys out there doing this different combinations different types of parts and uh, you just have to decide what's in your budget what you have to spend for the initial engine kit you know do you want a use case do you want a new case do you want used cylinder heads do you want new cylinders uh, there's just a lot of decisions to make when it comes to the parts uh, I like to buy new parts. Uh, I don't, I'm not a you know hone the cylinder and use it over kind of guy. Not too often, but I do do it. It's just what you can afford and uh, what you're actually uh, wanting out of the project. So you just need to decide what you want to do with the project, and I'll be glad to help you with it any way I can. Whether it's making videos for you or uh, assemble the engine and send it to you, however you want to do it. Uh, Somebody wanted to know the difference between an IDF and an IDA intake manifold. And uh, that's pretty obvious, but I'll show you anyway. Here's a, here's an IDF. You can see that the uh, IDF is pretty compact. And uh, here's an IDA. It's a little spread out, a little more wider. Same at the bottom. It's just uh, wider at the top and uh, almost the same exact flange just in a different position so I prefer the IDAs a lot of guys prefer the IDFs it's uh, whatever you want to do I've seen some stuff go pretty fast and make some good power with IDFs and I would have never imagined but I'm a 48 guy I like the IDAs I sort of like the way they sound and uh, the way they look and I guess that's why I use them. So, but an IDF works good too. Again, it's just what you can afford and what you're trying to get out of the car. Most people aren't trying to, uh, you know, get maximum performance out of their project. The one guy that did contact me, I think he mentioned that he wanted to beat the snot out of it. So, uh, you know, when you want to beat the snot out of it, we got to we got to take a few precautions, but it's it's uh, quite possible to beat the snot out of one and have good luck. So I'm not not afraid to get involved if you want to beat the snot out of it. But uh, hopefully that answered a couple of your questions. Uh, and we went over a few things. I think I covered a few of the emails I got. I need to get back out to uh, making some videos. Been sort of taking a little uh, siesta, vacation, whatever you want to call it. I don't know. But I uh, haven't been making the videos. Been watching videos, but haven't been making them. So uh, I did order some parts. Got some parts coming in for the 2110. So I uh, uncovered that. I have the 2110 project over here. And uh, got the header ordered. And uh, we'll see if it shows up or not. But here's the 2110 motor that we've been building. It's a 48 IDA motor with a set of wedge port uh, CB performance heads. It's got an empty crank with a set of scat rods and uh, one of uh, 
Pat Downs tricky little cams. We're gonna see how much power this thing makes. It's supposed to make really good power, but uh, only one way to find out is put it in a car. So uh, been waiting on the header. It was on back order, and I finally found it through uh, Scat. They had it listed. So wanted an inch and three quarter for this. Inch and five eighths is uh, prevalent. It's what's available, but that's not what I wanted. So uh, we'll have to build some sort of a muffler for it. Once we get in the car, we'll do a Flowmaster setup, and then we'll uh, go to the track and beat the snot out of it, see what it does. Uh, so that's that one. I think we got everything for this motor. I bought a coil the other day. I think I uh, might have sold the fan belt off of it. Been working on the uh, blue bug a little bit, fixing the uh, rust. So that's uh, what these late model ones look like inside. Uh, battle on the uh, foam. You can see the uh, foam they use at the dealer. And this stuff is open cell, so it gets water in it, and it just uh, it rusts. And uh, when I was a teenager, I really didn't fix it right. I packed it full of Bondo, and uh, it's time to uh, do it right now. So I uh, cut all that out, got the uh, steel there, and we'll start making a patch for that. I got this whole thing stripped to bare steel. And uh, that's really the only rust spots on this car, both sides and the bottom of this quarter. Uh, I hammered and dollied the hood out. It's pretty decent now. The roof's pretty nice. Got it slapped with a slapper dolly and got most of the stuff out of it. This door needs a little more work and I have to wipe some Bondo here and there. But uh, this is my major project. I'm going to cut the inner out too and replace that. I'm going to do one side at a time because this is a pretty big uh, endeavor, but it needs to be done. This side's not near as bad, but uh, you know, it's, it's just as bad. I shouldn't say it's not near as bad because it'll have to be cut to here. And uh, there's a brace that runs through here and then it's solid foam. And uh, it's too dark to show you right now, but I'm not lying to you. I bet there's five pounds of uh, foam in there, packed in there from down there to here. And uh, all up in here too. That's all of this is from the water gets in here and it just soaks that foam down. So we'll cut it out and fix it right. I'm gonna put this in some sort of etch or epoxy the rest of the car while I'm doing the metal work so it doesn't get away from me. I've been going over it with the DA. I need to hit it with some 180 and then wipe it with uh, some lacquer thinner and clean rags and then it'll be ready for some uh, coating. So. Been working on the Nova a little bit. You guys want to know about that? Here's the uh, dash. Got the uh, relays here. I'm gonna try to snake all this underneath. Switches, light, relay for each switch and light. And then the uh, power block here. And I'm gonna put a race pack dash in it. I took the uh, speedometer out and instead of going back with that, it's gonna put a race pack in it. And uh, That'll be pretty cool. That'll give me pretty much everything I want to buy. I'll be able to monitor and uh, stuff. Oh, got the uh, Pontiac cut in half. Here, let me set this over here. Uh, I'll move some stuff around. Yeah. I'm going to throw it all on the floor. I hate the electrical part. There's nothing worse. There we got some more wiring done. Got the uh, fuel system all done. I think you guys have seen that. Ran the nitrous, got the fuel, got the insulator there, mounted the coil, mounted the MSD, ran the uh, wires to the MSD, ran the ground to the back of the car, and uh, put the shifter in. I don't know if you can see that. And uh, Put the dry shaft loop in. Got that done. And hopefully, uh, I think Friday, got some friends coming over to help me put the tranny in. And uh, hopefully, we can start it soon here. I got to plumb the uh, fuel cell at the back of the car. That shouldn't be too much work. And uh, should be ready to go. That light's probably messing with my video. This light. Needs to be on YouTube. There you go. Much better. In case some of you didn't see that, 
it came out pretty sweet. This is the uh, oil pressure, and these would be run inside the car. And I uh, still need a belt. I uh, got a couple of belts that didn't fit. It's sort of a weird size, 41 inches, not 42. It's got to be 41. So, uh, so yeah, I've been working on this a little bit of time. Me and Hans have been working on his car. Got the hood over here, stripped it down the metal because the uh, e-coat got compromised on this. And uh, I know better, I should have stripped it first, but I uh, you know, thought I could get away with something. And uh, I scuffed the e-coat up with a Scotch-Brite pad. And when I put the uh, paint on there, uh, I painted it once and I wasn't really happy because it, you know, it shined up when I sprayed it, it looked really good but it died back and I didn't uh, really know why it died back. Conditions were pretty good when I painted it. And uh, rather than try to buff the bottom side of the hood, I just sanded it with 600 and uh, resprayed it. And when I resprayed it, it just uh, softened everything up and it died back again. So it was definitely the e-coat messing with me. So we'll uh, take that off and uh, start from there. Go with some etch and then epoxy. That e-coat, you really got to watch. It depends on the quality of the uh, part, I guess. You know, you never know whether it's a waterborne or uh, a solvent base. And I believe this was probably a waterborne is why I had the issue. But, uh, so, yeah, I think that's about it. And then uh, somebody wanted to know about rod bolt stretch and all that. You don't need to know about rod bolt stretch unless you're going to use an aftermarket rod. Uh, Volkswagen rod bolt will never let you down. Uh, 27 foot pounds take a, a little uh, chisel this is a late model rod so it doesn't have the uh, slot in it to uh, knock the washer down or paint it over a lot of rods will be slotted and the washer is on the bottom of the bolt you can take a little chisel and stake the bolt or the washer you can't do that with these rods but uh, the only time we measure bolts is if you're using an aftermarket bolt and the reason why we measure it is uh, you torque a bolt stretch. And the aftermarket bolts, you want to measure the bolt before you torque it and write that number down. And then when you torque it, you're looking for five to six on the stretch. And once you have five or six thousandths, the bolt has the proper clamp load to keep the rod cap on the rod. And when you disassemble the motor, if you have the number that you recorded before you assembled the engine, if the bolt comes back to within one thousandths of that number, you can use the bolt again. And if the bolt doesn't come back within one, say if it's one and a half or two thousandths or greater, that you need to replace the bolt because it's stretched and it's lost its torque to yield. So that's why we use the stretch gauge. Uh, basic tools for the uh, stock 1600 though you'll need a torque wrench and uh, maybe some snap ring pliers and uh, some basic stuff that we can go over and get you set up so that's about it I'm gonna go inside get some uh, air from the air condition it's about uh, 